Welcome to, to, to Ann Street this morning. We're glad that you are here. And if this is your first time here, we are exceptionally glad that you are here. Uh, please, please know that just by your being here, you have, have honored us and we hope to, to bring the glory of God to you this morning as you worship with us. Uh, Please sign the pew pads at the end of your pews. Pass those down so everybody gets the time to sign those, okay? So we have a record of your attendance. And uh, if you have somebody on a pew next to you, make sure you make sure you meet them before we get done today, okay? Uh, we're going to begin our worship in just a moment as Candace comes to play our prelude. And I invite you to, to center yourself upon God and to be ready for the Holy Spirit this morning. Oh, and moms, happy Mother's Day.
hey, happy Mother's Day, and sign in on those pew pads. And uh, the pastor, he wants to introduce a, a video to you, and I'm going to let him do that. Grace and peace, good morning, and thank you, Jim. And Leonard's going to come, actually going to have Leonard introduce it. Uh, Leonard's one of our vision team members, and as you know, uh, they've been working uh, for a year now and, uh, and, and have a lot to share, uh, but we're breaking it up into short little chunks, and today we're going to see one more piece of what they're up to and what they've uh, discovered listening to God. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, last week, Sharon uh, introduced the first section of the videos that kind of sum, sum up summarized where the vision team was coming from, some of the research we did, and um, a whole lot of praying, a whole lot of meeting. Uh, this morning we have the second one, which carries a little further on to, okay, if that's the situation we're working with, then why, how are the steps, uh, what are the steps that we need to move forward? I think this video does a, a really good job of that, and I hope you enjoy it. You might be asking, what does a vision team do? We have the Bible. Why do we need a vision? Isn't it the duty of the pastor to tell us their vision for the church? These questions assume two things. One, that the leader is the chief problem solver. And two, that planning is about finding a solution that will satisfy all the voices in the congregation. In actuality, strategic planning does not focus on problem solving. Instead, it is about having a purposeful conversation about who we are and what God calls us to do. The vision is the product of the team's conversation with God and about the future. And the pastor's role is to help the church discern the vision and faithfully follow it. That's why your Ann Street United Methodist Church vision team focused on listening to God. They prayed, studied God's Word, listened to you, prayed some more, studied our community, and prayed even more. They pondered what you, the people of Ann Street Church, want out of church. But they also wondered about the people who are not yet part of Ann Street Church. What do they want out of church? Early on, the vision team agreed that things are basically good at our church. What we are already doing is faithful and authentic. Some churches start a vision process because they are in a crisis. We are not. We can focus on developmental planning, which means determining the next steps for our congregation and building on our present strengths. We can dream about even greater ways we can be faithful to God at Ann Street Church. To guide their planning, the vision team asked two main questions. What is our purpose? And what is God calling us to be and do? The first question is the basis for Ann Street Church's mission statement. A mission statement is a statement of identity and purpose. Who are we? What defines us as a church? That's the mission statement. The second question is the basis for the vision statement. What is God calling us to be and do? How do we get from our present to the future God has for us? Where are we headed? That's the vision statement. The mission statement describes who we are. The vision statement describes where we are headed. After lots of prayer and reflection, the team arrived at the mission statement and vision statement that they shared with the congregation last October. Let's review it here. Our mission statement says that Ann Street United Methodist Church is making disciples of Jesus Christ by the sea and throughout God's creation. When we are at our most faithful and effective, we are making disciples of Jesus Christ by the sea and throughout God's creation. Central to this mission statement is the phrase, making disciples of Jesus Christ. You may recognize this from Jesus' Great Commission in Matthew 28:16 to 20, where Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. These were their marching orders. Go make disciples. Your vision team also remembered what Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, the disciples were to spread the gospel by beginning where they were in Jerusalem, spreading out to the surrounding region of Judea, then further out to the strangers of Samaria, and even further out to the ends of the earth. Therefore, the mission statement says that Ann Street Church is making disciples by the sea and throughout God's creation. We share the gospel where we are, and then further and further out to the ends of the earth. 
That's our purpose and mission. So how will we carry out this mission? That's where the vision statement comes in. With passion ignited by the Holy Spirit, we will grow in disciple-making throughout our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Can you find the common thread between the mission statement and the vision statement? That's right, it's disciple-making. The vision team believes that God calls Ann Street Church to grow in doing what we do when we are at our best. We don't need to reinvent ourselves. We just need to be our most faithful selves. There are two dimensions to growing in disciple making, vertical and horizontal. We grow vertically in the sense that we grow deeper in relationship with God. We grow as God's disciples. We grow horizontally in the sense that we reach out to other people too. The gospel goes out from this place to make more disciples of Jesus Christ. The disciple making is God's idea, not ours. It comes from God's heart. And as Christians, we worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The vision team connects the mission statement and vision statement with the Holy Trinity. Ignited by the Holy Spirit, we are making disciples of Jesus Christ throughout the Father's creation. Finally, the vision statement invokes our membership vows as United Methodists. Did you notice that? We are to make disciples through our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. These are the essential five ways we faithfully participate in the ministries of the church. So let's read these two vital statements one more time. These have been recommended by the vision team and approved by the church council. The mission statement says that we are making disciples of Jesus Christ by the sea and throughout God's creation. The vision statement declares that with passion ignited by the Holy Spirit, we will grow in disciple making through our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Now that we have these two statements, now that we know they are biblically based, now that we know they build on the strengths of Ann Street United Methodist Church, we can breathe them in. We can say them to ourselves, to one another, to our community, and throughout God's creation. We can explore their meaning for us as a church. We can live by them, and we can make them our prayer. God, grant us the grace to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together for our call to worship this morning. <clears throat> Delighted in God's ways. We are like trees planted by streams of water. Abiding in God's mercy. We are like our children sheltered against the storm. Filled with the Holy Spirit. We are one in Christ. Come. Let all who draw breathe worship the Lord. Let all who draw breath, get it right, right? Worship the Lord. Uh, let's greet each other with the peace and fellowship of Jesus Christ. Uh, turn, just shake a hand, offer them the Christ, the Spirit of Christ.
may be seated, and I'm going to invite Joe to come and to lead our, our hymn singing this morning. Good morning. We'll kick things off with number 98, To God Be the Glory. Follow that with 395, take time to be holy. From the congregation? 505. 505. And as we sing this, I would invite the children to come forward for the children's message to follow. 505. everybody how are you today you're good you good I can't hear a word oh my so quiet well today's Mother's Day right everybody hug their mom huh you hug your mom or a grandmom today maybe maybe not okay hey, the Bible today and we're gonna be reading a passage in just a minute it's in the what, what the part of the Bible is called the Psalms but it talks about doing what God tells us to do. And if you do what God tells you to do, if you do, what do you think God tells us to do? God tells us to do the right thing. And so it says, if you do the right thing, you will always be rewarded by it. But if you do the wrong thing, do you get a reward for doing the wrong thing? No. If you do the wrong thing, do you get yelled at? Maybe. Do you, do you get punished? Maybe. Well, doing the wrong thing, not a good thing. So the Bible says that what God wants us to do is the right thing. And if you do the right thing, you'll be rewarded. If you do the wrong thing, Oh, it's not going to be good for you. Oh, it's not going to be good for you. Now, 
I remember when I was in school. I was in the third grade. Anybody up to the third grade yet? No? What grade are you in? Um, second. Second grade. You're almost there. We're at the end of the year. So I was about your age. I was in the third grade, and we had a boy in my class. His name was Larry Keezer. Larry Keezer was by far the biggest boy in the third grade. Do you know why he was the biggest boy in the third grade? Because he had been held back in the first grade twice. He had been held back in the second grade once. So Larry Keezer was supposed to be in the sixth grade but he was in the third grade, and he was big, and he was mean. Oh, he was a bully. Oh, he was a bully. And I remember, oh, he never did the right thing, especially to me, especially to me. And I remember hearing the preacher talk about how God rewards people who do the right thing and punishes people who do the wrong thing and I thought God doesn't punish Larry Keezer. <laughs> I didn't think Larry Keezer would ever get his comeuppance. I just didn't think so. Well, I'll tell you a little secret about Larry Keezer. He failed the third grade too. And so when I went on to the fourth grade, I was past Larry Keezer, and I didn't have to worry about his mean bullying in anymore. Never saw him again until we were all grown up. And when we were all grown up, I saw Larry Keezer, and I remembered how big he was. But guess who was bigger now? Yet Larry Keezer ended up growing up to be about five foot five. And I'm about six foot four, or I used to be. Okay? And so I was way taller. And I thought, huh, let's see who gets to be the bully now. And then I thought, now wait a minute, wait a minute. God wants me to do the right thing regardless of what everybody else does. Regardless of what everybody else does. And so, when I saw Larry Keezer, I just said hello and walked right by him. He didn't even know who I was. I had grown so much. But I found out All his meanness, do you think he got him anywhere? No. Do you think he had a lot of friends? No. I ended up a whole lot better off just by doing what God wanted me to do. And so that's the way we, do, we live. We live doing the right thing, regardless of what everybody else does or even does to us. Do you think we can do that? Maybe? Maybe? Hey, thanks for coming down here with me this morning. Nay, do you think I can get back up after I sat down here? <laughs> we'll find out, won't we? I, 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 I'm going to try. I've got a brand new hip. We're going to try it out. All right, thanks for coming down here with me this morning. invite you to turn to that psalm number one it's uh, page 738 
Can we try it again, Candace? We didn't get it. who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water that yields their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, Therefore the, the wicked, wicked will not stand in the judgment. judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And we're very thankful to come now to the gospel and to hear the words of our Lord Jesus. Uh, this from John 17, 6 through 19. And please know this is uh, you're overhearing Jesus praying to the Father. That's the context here. It's a long prayer in the, towards the end of John in which Jesus prays to the Father. So let's listen in because he wants us to hear what he is praying. Hear the word of the Lord. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I have come from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All are mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. He prays to the Father. Holy Father, protect them in your name and that you have given me, so that they may be one as you and I are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Have you ever walked in on someone when they were praying? Have you ever walked in on someone when they were praying? I'd say this probably happens to waiters and waitresses a lot. Don't they ever come up sometimes to your table and you're in the middle of your blessing, but they say, oh, I've got your honey chipotle crispers and your waffle appetizers with bacon and jalapenos, and oh, I'm sorry, you know. And they realize that your heads are all bowed and you're having a prayer. I've been walked in on while praying in the sanctuary in every church that I've uh, had the honor of leading and, and serving. It happens on a weekday when folks understandably assume that the sanctuary is empty, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> I'm often, sometimes, 
not often enough perhaps, but in the, in the sanctuary praying and uh, someone walks in. Now, church members, this is no problem. You know, they're doing something that needs to be done. Maybe they're coming for their own prayer time. But service people and vendors and uh, outside groups and things, those are always a little interesting. I, you'd imagine with the pastor there in the quiet of the sanctuary, if there's any sound, there might just be the sound of angels singing praises. But no, it's not that. It's sometimes the sound of the HVAC repairman cursing out the machine outside because he can't get it to work right. <clears throat> Have you ever walked in on someone when they are praying privately? Maybe you didn't even make a sound, but you came that person's way and there they were with head bowed and it sometimes happens that a child walks into mom or dad's room and finds mom or dad with eyes closed and head bowed. Or it might be a grandparent, a grandmother on Mother's Day perhaps, with a Bible in her lap. And maybe you're too young to know that she's praying until she tells you, What are you doing, Grandma? I was praying, sweetheart. What are you praying about? I was praying for you. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a very gratifying thing to be told that you are being prayed over. Have you ever had that? To know that someone, especially someone you love and admire, has been holding you before God Almighty in prayer. Have you ever had that feeling, that knowledge? It's not just the fact that they thought of you, which is itself important. But the power comes in the realization that you have been included in their most intimate communication with the Creator, and you didn't even know it. Have you ever had that feeling? Have you? Isn't it beautiful? Amazing? A little sidebar, real quick. That's why it's so, it's so powerful. That's why I'm so trying to be so careful with those powerful five words. I will pray for you. Those aren't words to be thrown around easily. I say them and as a best I can only if I am 100% sure that I will be praying for that person in the next 24 hours and not grouping them with all the people that ought to be prayed for, but praying for that person if I tell them that. I think that goes for the same way when it comes to how we interact with each other on social media when we pray for one another. Um, to, to say you're in my prayers or even just prayers are sending up or something like that. Beautiful thing, you know, wonderful things. But I hope that we're all really doing them, not just saying them as sort of a religious thinking of you card. It's understandable that we pledge to pray for one another in those ways. Remember that you are saying when you say that, that you are giving that person the precious gift of discovering that love that someone is really praying for them. And so if you're giving them that gift, it ought to be really backed up. It ought to be, that check ought to be cashed, right? Back to our text, though, considering what a beautiful gift it is to learn that someone is praying for you, we come back to John 17. It's traditionally called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's before his crucifixion. It's before he's going to face his most uh, painful times. It's the longest running words from Jesus in all the Bible. And towards the end of his speech, he then turns his address to the Father and he begins to pray. And right there in front of his disciples, he prays for them. It was a prayer he wanted them to overhear. He wanted them to feel prayed for or prayed over, <clears throat> as we sometimes say. He was praying out loud about them in the third person, but not uh, in the way that we used to talk about people without really talking to them. You ever see someone do that? Moms, you might know about this one, you know. When you say, I sure hope little Johnny eats all his vegetables at dinner tonight like a good boy. This wasn't like that. This wasn't talking about you to talk to you. This was special, sincere, holy communication between the Father and the Son. This is communion between two persons of the Trinity. And what do they talk about? The latest goings on in heaven? The big multi-cell storm system moving through the earth? The alignment of the planets? 
What do they talk about? The Father and the Son. They talk about the disciples. Out of all the creation and the cosmos that they are holding together, they focus on individual people. Those who seek God's face. What will happen to them when Jesus isn't there? They pray about that. What will they need from God? They pray about that. How shall they live in community with one another? The Father and the Son pray about that. These disciples and you and I even now, even now, are the focus of God's attention and God's inner dialogue. If you ever stop to imagine how radical and amazing that is? From the content of Jesus' prayer, we can see a few things that Jesus does. We know and we see that God has been thinking about us. That's remarkable in and of itself. And then we see that God has been wondering how we will get along when we're on our own. How are we going to be getting along today and tomorrow. God is caring about that and praying about that in the language of the Trinity. How are we doing? And God is hoping that we will act right. Right, Jim, as you said in your children's sermon. Act like we've been raised to act. That's what Jesus says in the prayer too. God help them follow the way I showed them. So I want you to think about that for a moment. God has been thinking about you God has been wondering how you will get along when you are out of town and on your own. God is hoping you will act right like you've been raised to act. Now, I repeated those because I'm going to say this. Mom has been thinking about you. Mom has been wondering how you will get along when you're on your own. Mom is hoping you will act right like you've been raised to act. Yes, here on Mother's Day, we can see how God prays for us like a mother. I don't get all flustered and think, oh, he's messing with the Trinity and he's calling God the mother and the... the, the, the. No, mother with a lowercase m if you want. That's fine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the idea that God prays for you and cares for you much like mother does. The prayer that Jesus prays, the concerns and considerations of it, is like walking in on grandma with her head bowed and the Bible in her lap. What are you doing, grandma? I was praying, sweetheart. What are you praying for? I was praying for you. I was praying that the Father will protect you. I was praying that you will get along with your brothers and sisters. I was praying that you will feel joy even when I'm not around anymore. That's what I was praying for you. For you. And so as we think about what it is for God to pray for us, how it reminds us of a, love, a mother's love too, I remember a few weeks into my time here at Ann Street Church when at the end of the sermon I asked you to group together with those around you and pray together in small groups for one another. It was a little uncomfortable for some, I, I certainly understand that, but I asked you to push on through that awkwardness and you did. And I lost track of how many of you told me what a blessing it was to you to pray for others and to have them pray for you. But I also know, too, that for some people, such a, a time is painfully awkward. Uh, so I want to offer you a modified one today. If you're someone that's just, you would just really like to have this time with God directly, just you and God, then when you're praying, just bow your head, and we'll know. But if you're someone who wants to pray with the person next to you or for or with the person around you, do that, too, and, and just know that's fine, too. We're going to take as our example Jesus' prayer. Call, it, the, call this text today the other Lord's Prayer. That Jesus prays that the disciples will have what they need to carry on as disciples. What would it look like for you to pray for one another? 
Uh, let's be honest, we're all aging, no matter how young we are. And there are always going to be things, and we'll pray about them in our prayer time today, things to pray about in the, in the health processes and the aging processes. But today I want to ask you in this moment to think about how you can pray for one another, how you can pray that the other person will have and know what God would have them do, how they can be sent into the world to be faithful to God, and how they will love God and love their neighbor. Just beautiful things. And in there, give thanks to God for mothers, because we'll do that in a while too. Will you do that? Because I'm praying for you. I really am. I really am. And Jesus is praying for you. Absolutely. So will you pray for one another for a few moments? Again, if you're uh, one to pray by yourself, go ahead and do that. But if you're one to join with the person around you, do that too. Let's pray. Please have your seats. Let us come before God uh, in a time of prayer. I have an honor of reading a proclamation from the bishop. Uh, she has, uh, when uh, matters arise, that she would uh, like to uh, have uh, us note. She sends out a, uh, a note to the pastors, and we uh, have the opportunity to read them. This is about uh, teachers and about schools and uh, her uh, and the Western North Carolina Conference's bishop uh, joined together to say this. 
They say, and I'm reading just a portion, as members of the General Assembly return to Raleigh on May 16th, we offer four ways to support public schools, the children who learn in them and the teachers who teach them. The first, they say, pray privately and in worship services for children in North Carolina, for educators, and for the General Assembly. Number two, participate along with teachers in the statewide witness for public education on Wednesday from 9 to 3 in Raleigh and visit legislators to urge their priority attention to the needs of North Carolina children and those who teach them. Third, she says, offer personal encouragement to young people who are preparing to become teachers and offer thanks to those you know who are teachers, staff, and administrators in our public schools. And fourth, contact by phone, email, or letter your representative in the General Assembly, urging the priority of public schools and state funding. And invite an offering of letters on a Sunday with letter writing materials available to increase the witness for children. And she offers a prayer that uh, we will incorporate into our prayer uh, and, and time today too. Uh, so these, uh, this uh, read to you uh, on their behalf and, uh, and from their hearts. We also pray for one another. Did I lose that? Oh, okay. Uh, we also pray to one another today. Uh, Harriet Kirk raises a prayer for Faye Wooten, concern for her health. Uh, the uh, Lawton family raises uh, three prayers, one for Joanne and Gerald Scott, another for John Kelly, another that I'll save for just a moment that we all want to, to pray on too. Uh, I would also lift up Alan Spivey, and we hope that he's continuing to do well. And Joyce Colette has been moved to Duke. We thought she would be moved to Greenville, but she's gone to Duke uh, for some help uh, there. And uh, Teresa Miller lifts up a, a prayer for Berkeley Piner and also this uh, other matter. The other matter is, is a prayer for the Stone family. Um, Carol, Jerry, uh, Carol's mom. Uh, they, Carol lost her sister very tragically this week in a car accident. And Carol, we uh, would, would lift up uh, her memory with you and for you and, and send our love to you and your mother especially and Jerry and all your family uh, at this tender time. So may God be with us and be with you especially. Uh, these and many other concerns we bring before God today. Uh, we also have a prayer for mothers and all women. Uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll begin the prayer and it has in it um, moments of uh, silent reflection or moments of personal prayer for you. Uh, I'll prompt you with a prayer for mothers or for women uh, in different situations. And you think of the ones that, that come to your mind or just them in general and lift them up in prayer. And then I'll close that with our uh, pastoral prayer and we'll all pray together our Lord's Prayer. So let us go to God together. Most loving God, on this special day of honor and memory, we bring before you our prayers for one another and especially for the mothers and all women in our lives and in our world. For mothers who have given us life and love, that we may show them reverence and love, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have lost a child, that their faith may give them hope, and their family and friends support and console them. We pray to the Lord. For women, though without children of their own, who like mothers have nurtured and cared for us, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have been unable to be a source of strength, to respond to their children and families, we pray to the Lord. Loving God, as a mother gives life and nourishment to her children, so you watch over your church. Bless these women that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth and grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always. O oh God, we come to you with thankful hearts for mothers this day and all women 
And we join those prayers with the prayers for our sisters and brothers uh, who may have particular need in their life. Perhaps a need for healing or a need for uh, protection, a need for hope, a need for providence and sustenance. We lift up before you all those whom we may have forgotten to pray for, whom we've said we'll pray for you, but then we remember what it is that we say. We give you thanks this day for caring for us as Jesus did, as he showed us what it is to love and nurture. And we pray that you will guide us in his paths, that we will be true to the prayer he gave to the Father about us, even the prayer that he spoke for us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.